March is a turning point in the astrophotography calendar because it's the start of galaxy season. Instead of colorful nebulae, we now look into the depths of space, where hundreds of millions of galaxies come into view. Hi, I'm Tim and you're watching Cosmic Captures. In this video, I will guide you through the night sky in March and highlight the best sky targets with practical tips for every setup and skill level. And this month, I've also included some fantastic southern sky targets. And if that wasn't enough, both the Moon and the Sun are putting up a show this month with two rare celestial events you won't want to miss. So let's get started. The Moon plays a huge role in what we can capture. And this month brings us not just the usual lunar phases, but also two eclipse events. And here's what's happening in March. The first quarter moon falls on March the 6th, a great time to capture lunar surface details with long shadows along the Terminator. And the moon sets after midnight, leaving us dark skies in the hours before dawn. The full moon on March 14th is known as the warm moon, marking the seasonal transition to spring. And this month it comes with something special a total lunar eclipse on the night of March 13th into March 14th. It will be visible across most of the Americas, Western Europe and Africa, with the Moon turning a deep red during totality. Check timeanddate.com for exact timings in your location. The last quarter Moon follows on March the 22nd. During this phase the Moon rises after midnight and that means we have perfect dark sky conditions during the first half of the night. Then on March the 29th we have the new Moon bringing us the darkest skies of the month, perfect for faint deep sky imaging. But that's not all. On the same day a partial solar eclipse will be visible across Northeastern America, Europe, Northern Africa and Western Asia. And this is a rare chance to see the Moon partially covering the Sun. But safety is crucial, so always use proper solar filters for observation and imaging. For exact timings and visibility in your area, check timeanddate.com. Do you want to plan your imaging sessions more effectively? Then download the Moonlight Astrophotography Planner, also called MAP, from my website. It will help you determine the best time for deep sky and nightscape photography based on the Moon's brightness and phase. So whether you're capturing the Moon itself, planning deep sky imaging or chasing an eclipse, this March offers plenty of opportunities to get outside and photograph the sky. March is often thought of as the start of galaxy season for deep sky astrophotographers. But for nightscape photographers, I like to think of it as the start of arch season. In the Northern Hemisphere, the Milky Way core is still low on the horizon. But spring is actually one of the best times to capture wide field panoramas of the Milky Way stretching across the sky. In the evening, you can still photograph the Winter Milky Way with Orion setting in the west. And later in the night, the Summer Milky Way starts making its return, with the core just peaking above the southeastern horizon before dawn. And this low position of the Milky Way makes it perfect for capturing those sweeping arches over the landscape. In the Southern Hemisphere, it's a different story. By mid to late March, the Milky Way core rises earlier and climbs high into the sky before dawn. And this marks the start of the prime Milky Way season in the south, with the core standing tall above the horizon. A perfect opportunity for vertical Milky Way compositions or core-focused nightscapes. And of course, this month's eclipses offer unique opportunities to combine the sky with landscapes. But now, let's move on to the deep sky objects for March, 
starting with the target of the month. The Leo triplet is a classic galaxy group and a perfect introduction to galaxy season. Compared to the nebulae we focused on last month, most of which were a few thousand light years away, we are now making a huge leap outward into deep space. These galaxies lie around 30 to 35 million light years away. And that's not just across the Milky Way, it's beyond it in another galaxy altogether. For smaller telescopes, galaxies like these can feel frustrating because they appear so small. But there's another way to approach them. Instead of zooming in, you can frame all three galaxies together, showing their context in space. A field of view around 1 to 1.5 one degrees works well to capture the entire group with some breathing room around them. And long exposures with a wide field can reveal faint tidal streams. These are wispy tails of stars pulled out by gravitational forces as galaxies interact. And these delicate structures tell the story of how galaxies evolve and sometimes even merge. So wide but deep images can reveal hidden drama in a way that a tight close-up can't. Galaxies are faint and diffuse objects and imaging them is much easier from a dark sky location. And if you want to bring out those tidal streams and faint halos around galaxies, then dark skies are almost essential. That said, brighter galaxies like the Leo triplet can still be captured from light polluted areas, especially with careful processing. And while we talk about light pollution, we can also talk about filters. Galaxies are broadband targets, meaning that you want to collect light across the full visible spectrum. So narrowband filters like those you use for nebulae generally won't work. For most galaxy imaging, luminance and RGB filters or just an unfiltered color camera will give you the best results. And finally, when it comes to exposure times, galaxies benefit from longer sub-exposures to collect as much faint details as possible. From a dark sky site, I generally recommend 3 to 5 minute exposures. If you are working on the light polluted skies, shorter exposures around 1 to 2 minutes can help avoid washing out your images. But you will need to compensate by stacking more frames. But the final result can still be beautiful. The Leo triplet is best seen from the Northern Hemisphere, but is also visible from many southern locations, not just quite as high in the sky. Next is NGC 3521, sometimes called the Bubble Galaxy, because the faint halo of shells and streams that surround it. It's another great galaxy in Leo with a flocculent spiral structure, meaning its spiral arms appear softer and patchy rather than well-defined, giving it a more chaotic and textured look. A narrower field of view around 30 to 40 arc minutes frames the entire galaxy beautifully, with some room around it to capture its fainter outer features. Also, long exposures and dark skies will make a big difference in revealing these details. NGC 3521 is mainly a Northern Hemisphere target, but it's still visible from much of the South, though it stays lower on the horizon. Now, NGC 3521 is the kind of galaxy that really benefits from a longer focal length to bring out its details. And I know, if you're using a small telescope, you might be thinking, well, what can I actually capture during galaxy season? But don't count yourself out just yet, because smaller setups and even entry-level smart telescopes can still be a lot of fun during galaxy season. Let me show you why. So you think your telescope is too small? Well then, Think again. Take the C-Star S50 for example. With a field of view of 
0.72 degrees by 1.28 degrees, it's surprisingly well suited for capturing smaller galaxies. And with modern stacking and processing techniques, even a small system can reveal faint details like tidal streams and galaxy interactions. I don't own a smart telescope at the moment, but just look at the Seastar images by Andre Vlies for some inspiration on just how much detail a compact setup can capture during galaxy season. So if you're using a smart telescope or a small refractor, don't assume that galaxy season isn't for you. And to prove that small telescopes can hold their own, let's take a look at this next target, where I captured some fascinating details with a tiny setup. This next pairing offers a fascinating contrast between deep sky objects. M97, also called the Owl Nebula, is a planetary nebula. A dying star shedding its outer layers and leaving behind a glowing shell of gas. And nearby M108, the surfboard galaxy, is an edge-on spiral, with dark dust lanes running across it. A telescope with a moderate field of view can frame both objects in the same shot, making this a great composition for small to mid-sized setups. I actually captured both of these objects from my Bordel 6-7 backyard with a 250mm focal length Red Cat 51 telescope and a tiny pixel sensor camera. I've used 2 minute sub-exposures and stacked a total of 250 frames. And despite the light pollution, the result was surprisingly detailed. This just goes to show that you don't always need to have a huge telescope or dark skies, because with the right framing and processing, small setups can go a long way. M97 and M108 are northern hemisphere targets, and from southern latitudes, they get very low or might be not visible at all. Before we move on, I want to take a quick step back and talk about how astronomers classify galaxies. When you're imaging galaxies, you'll notice that they come in different shapes and structures. And this led astronomer Edwin Hubble to create Hubble's classification scheme, which sorts galaxies into a few main types based on their appearance. Elliptical galaxies are smooth and rounded, with very little visible structure. They often look like a soft glow in the sky. Spiral galaxies have bright cores with spiral arms wrapping around them. Sometimes we see these spirals face on, revealing intricate arms, and other times edge on, where they appear as thin streaks with dark dust lanes cutting across them. Barred spiral galaxies are a variation, where the spiral arms don't extend directly from the core, but instead from a bright bar of stars running through the center. Understanding these differences adds a new layer to your astrophotography. You're not just capturing a faint fuzzy object, you're revealing the structure and shape of entire galaxies each with its own story of formation, evolution, and sometimes dramatic interaction with its neighbors. And in our next target, you will see even more variety, where spirals and ellipticals line up side by side, showing that diversity in a single frame. March is also the start of galaxy cluster season. And nowhere is that clearer than with Markarian's chain in the Virgo cluster. This sweeping line of galaxies is a playground for wide field setups. A field of view of around 1.5 to 2 degrees is ideal for capturing the curve of the chain, along with some of the surrounding cluster members. A longer focal length will let you pick out individual galaxies but a wider field of view really emphasizes how these galaxies are part of something much larger, a massive cluster bound together by gravity. Macarian's chain is also a good target for DSLR and mirrorless shooters. 
with a telephoto lens of around 200 millimeters or longer on a star tracker, you can capture the chain and several surrounding galaxies showing their alignment in the sky. Markarian's chain is a fantastic target for the Northern Hemisphere, but it's also visible for many parts of the Southern Hemisphere, just sitting a bit lower in the sky. Next is M104, the Sombrero Galaxy. It's small but bright and famous for its dust lane cutting across a bright core. This target works well with longer focal lengths, but even small telescopes can show its distinctive shape. A tight field of view of around 15 arc minutes works well for a close-up view. But going a little bit wider helps to frame the faint outer halo better. As with all galaxies, broadband imaging, which means no narrowband filters, is the way to go. M104 is actually better seen from the southern hemisphere but it's still visible from lower latitude northern locations, just closer to the horizon. And finally, exclusively for observers in the southern hemisphere, there's the Great Carina Nebula. This is one of the largest and brightest emission nebulae in the night sky, filled with dark dust lanes and glowing gas clouds. A wide field of view of around 2 to 3 degrees works well to capture the full structure, while closer crops can reveal details like the Keyhole Nebula around Eta Carinae. Unlike galaxies, emission nebulae shine in narrowband wavelengths like Hydrogen Alpha and Oxygen 3, making them excellent targets for dual narrowband or narrowband imaging. The Carina Nebula is also a fantastic target for DSLR and mirrorless shooters. Its large size and brightness means it works well with a camera and for example a 135mm lens on a simple star tracker. The Great Carina Nebula is a southern hemisphere object. It's visible from lower northern latitudes, but it never gets high above the horizon. So, those were the deep sky targets for March 2025. And now, I've been working on something new, something I think will make planning your next deep sky session even easier. In addition to the visual overview in this video, I've put together a detailed deep sky target list with all the key imaging information. Recommended fields of view, ideal filters, observability, coordinates and much more. You can download it as a printable PDF from my website. But I want to give this new edition a proper name. And for that, I love your input. I have two ideas. I could either call it DART, like Deep Sky Astrophotography Reference and Targets. It's precise, straight to the point and emphasizes its role as a target reference sheet. The other option is to call it CAP. Cosmic Astrophotography Planner. This one matches the map, which is the Moonlight Astrophotography Planner I already have, making for a nice pairing. So what do you think? Is it DART or is it CAP? Let me know in the comments which name you prefer. And if you're capturing any of this month's targets, let me know in the comments which objects you're planning to image or if you've already captured something. And if you didn't find a target that works for you, check out last month's video. Some of the nebulae I featured there are disappearing fast, but you still have a short window to capture them. Thanks for watching and clear skies to all of you.